You you recently spent some time in Cuba. First, I got to ask you why. Uh, well, have you ever tried Cuban rum? Oh, yeah. Okay, enough said. Well, let me start with this. We had some friends, and I don't know if this was an official trip. I don't know if this was one of the uh, one of those cruises out of Miami or whatever. But we have some friends here at the radio station that went on like a five-day, six-night, something like that, to Cuba. And they came back, and, and they've, they've got the movies, and they've got photos. And to be perfectly honest, Brian, it still looks kind of messy, and I wonder why anybody would go. How did it look to you, and what did you see? Well, you know, most people that go on cruise ships will go to uh, Havana or maybe on the, uh, uh, like the south uh, central part of the island, Tien Fuegos is a popular uh, cruise ship port. But uh, I go down to Santiago. Santiago is the second largest city in Cuba. Uh, it's on the, uh, the, the southeast portion of the, uh, of the island. They have a deep water port. Um, and it's kind of the New Orleans of Cuba, if you will. It's all about food, culture, music, dancing. Uh, very, very lively, friendly people. And um, we are working on some cultural exchanges between the city of Santiago and the city of New Orleans. And, but I'm, you know, w- one of the things I, I was hoping when I first started this, because I've been there a few times now, was that uh, uh, making some some friends and relationships in the uh, through the cultural sector uh, with artists and things like that, that it would help uh, entree into some good political relationships. And uh, it's starting to bear fruit. So things are changing with the passing of Fidel, at least. Um, I'll ask you, do you see a change under the watchful eye of Raul Castro? So it's a good question. Raul Castro, as we speak, the the presidential elections are going on in Cuba. The way it works there is they have kind of like neighborhood caucuses where they elect kind of a delegate who then goes to Havana where they elect more delegates, and then those people end up electing the next president. Now, I'm pretty sure they already know who it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be a big nail-biter. <laughs> but uh, Raul Castro is stepping down next year. He's going to retire, uh, move into his plantation right outside of Santiago. And, uh, you know, I don't think a lot is going to change immediately. But uh, as time goes by and uh, some of the old original revolution guys like Raul, and there's probably about five or six original guys still alive, as they start dying off, uh, I think we're going to see some changes down there. Nothing overnight, but look, one of the worst things that the government could have done to itself was allow the Internet about five years ago. Because now you have uh, the young people who are now, uh, you know, able to, they have smartphones and tablets and things, and they're able to see what else is out there in the world. And they have friends in other countries that they're able to video chat, and they're able to see how they live. And so what you're seeing is the younger generation is no longer buying into the system that they were taught. And they were no longer believing that the revolution was the greatest thing that ever happened in world history. You're going to D.C. today to brief some congressmen and women about your trip. What is your, what's the focus of your message going to be to them? Well, we, we kind of had a breakthrough. I was, uh, I was actually uh, meeting with, a, uh, let's call it a cabinet-level uh, government official down there. And, of course, and this is not a joke. When, when you know, kind of like when you, we have meetings here in the United States, uh, we, we, you know, people will have coffee or you know, juice or sodas or whatever. They have rum, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's nine in the morning or nine at night. You're drinking rum during the meeting, and so by the time you actually get to the business quarter, portion of the meeting, uh, you tend to be a little pickled, right? So uh, there was a. Uh, I, I was kind of joking with this uh, this official when I said, you know. I said, if we had rum this good in the United States, you know, it might be easier for me to convince, uh, you know, my government to lift the embargo. And she, and I was kind of tongue in cheek, but she said, oh, no, no, don't do that. We don't want you to lift the embargo. And I said, what? I huh? said, are you kidding? And, and then she kind of stopped herself. And I said, no, 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 look, if nobody else is around. I'm like, what, what did you mean? And she said, well, you know, obviously conditions are very poor here. She said, but the embargo in the United States makes a very convenient boogeyman for us to blame everything on. And if we didn't have it anymore, then the people would, would be looking for answers from us and uh, might, might cause another revolution, if you will. So I thought that was quite interesting because every time I'd been there before, it's all about the embargo, the embargo, the embargo. And come to find out, they don't really want us to lift it. So, you know, so I would say to people, especially, you know, Cuban-Americans who have been against any kind of normalization of relations with Cuba – um, if you really want to, you know, for lack of a better term, screw over the Castro regime, lift the embargo because it seems like it'll do more harm to them 
than you think. So you don't think she was practicing some uh, some sort of like double reverse turbo psychology on you? If she was sober, I would suspect that. But no, I think this was tri- uh, an off the cuff uh, comment that that turned into something. So uh, so we'll see. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna carry that message forward. And uh, look, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of agriculture that we could be selling down in Louisiana. The the, the the number one thing that people eat down there is rice. They they consume a ton of rice. They don't grow enough of it on the island to feed the 11 million people they have. So they buy it all from China and Vietnam, and uh, you know that takes a long time. It's not really good quality. They don't have good facilities to store it in before distribution. You know, we could put a ton of rice on a on a barge and have it to Cuba in two days from Louisiana, no matter what the weather is. So, uh, working with the agricultural committee, um, talked to uh, Dr. Ralph Abraham about this, and, and uh, you know, they're they're working on some proposals that may, might ease some of the restrictions, at least on agriculture and commodities trading with Cuba. So, you know, I think things are looking up. Uh, obviously, there's, there's still some political tensions, but uh, I think we're making some progress. To next 20 years, do you see any kind of big political shift in Cuba? I honestly think that inside of 20 years, uh, as the, the, the people who are the 20s and 30-year-olds right now become the 40s and 50-year-olds, uh, I think that the, the government is going to have a problem keeping up the subterfuge of, of communism and uh, the, the, the form of or the way of life they have now. Uh, I, and and I, I honestly think that if the United States finds a way to reasonably start trading with Cuba again, uh, I think we could see that, that time frame cut in half. I really do. I, I think because, look, re- revolution is in the blood of those people. They're a very resilient, vibrant, vibrant people. And uh, I think if they, if more of them, uh, or at least in 10, 15 years, there's going to be more of them that don't believe in the system than do. And and I would not be surprised to see at least a political revolution, if not another forced one like, like we saw Castro do in 59.